an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. <clears throat> For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in, in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Yeah, usually around Thanksgiving, we, uh, we take time to count our blessings. And uh, I was just thinking, what have you been blessed with recently? What could you thank God for especially? Family. Family, okay. What else have we got? Always the family. Wow. Okay, what else? Uh, career. Career. Keep going. Fellowship. Church, which is us. Church and fellowship. Faithful 15 today. <laughs> Anything else? Nature. Nature. Okay. Put down that joke. <laughs> new website. Safety. New Safety. Yeah. Protection. Protection. Okay, what else? Good transportation. Okay, that's the opposite. That's the third day. We used to have really bad cars. I got another And always one. calling someone to jump them or to sort them out. Thank God. The ability to wake up. Mm -hmm. Wake up. Life. Okay, we can do a few more if you like, but uh, that gives us a start. Website. Websites. Helping others. Okay, yeah. What they say, we, we're grateful to God, and I think we should take time every day remembering the good things that God has provided, and, he, and the Bible says He lavishes them upon us. But I want to go a little deeper than this, okay? What should we really understand as being the greatest blessing we have? Our salvation. Salvation. <coughs> And, and Paul's going to zero that in as we look at Ephesians chapter 1. He's going to zero it into redemption, even the forgiveness of sin. I want to focus on those two things today. Redemption, even the forgiveness of sin. That's verse 7 of the passage that Tony read to him. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. You know, we don't have forgiveness of sin. We're in trouble. Why? Penalty of or sin is death. Results in death. We sin. will die, and we'll die physically. We'll be dead spiritually, and ultimately, this eternal death. And, uh, and the world will basically say, listen, forget about guilt. Be true to yourself. Guilt is just an idiosyncrasy of the personality. Figure that one out, eh? It's not really real. You don't have to feel guilty and by you didn't believe in God he's a nice guy he will just sweep your sins under the rug and let you into heaven anyway not they will tell you that if you learn more you'll get over your guilt if you earn more you can get over your guilt if you burn everything gets behind and what you were taught and believe it you'll get rid of your guilt but the Bible basically draws us to the truth that nothing but the blood of Jesus can take away my sin. That sin is real and sin ultimately incurs judgment. It's appointed unto man wants to die and then the judgment, the wage of sin is death. Whosoever sins will die. Now God is not playing here. God doesn't waste words. And let's not try to think that we're more compassionate and loving than God. 
in that we would let people get off scot-free. No, we see this, you know, with the whole uh, change in, in justice in our nation, where more and more criminals are being set free by unjust judges. And basically our sense of justice is holding. No, you can't let that murderer out to go do that again, just because you as a judge figure that you can skip over what is the true law. We cannot do that. God is just. He will stay firm to his word. And so the way to sin is death. The soul that sins will die. We will face a just judge one day. And in order that if we are going to face him, okay, we need forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness means to be released from that which holds us primarily to the guilt of what we've done wrong. It speaks of release. In West Africa, as the missionaries were seeking to translate the scripture, they had a bit of a problem with this idea of redemption or redeemed. And they spoke to some of the advisors as they did the translation in the Bambara tribe in West Africa. And the, the fellow who was advising the translator said, redemption is God taking our head out. And he kind of looked at the guy and said, excuse me, God taking our head out. And he said, but I, can you explain more? He said, yes. You know, the Arab slave trade was very big in West Africa. They would go to the villages, capture the, the innocent people there, and put a, uh, a um, collar. collar around their necks and chain them to each other. That's terrible. And if passing through a village, a chief or a wealthy person saw someone he knew, he was allowed to redeem that person and take his head out of the collar. The Bible likens us to being slaves to sin, having that collar of guilt and sin around our neck and it's forgiveness and redemption basically have the idea of taking the collar off of our necks and this word redemption as we mentioned earlier is a new word it wasn't a religious word we see it almost entirely in terms of religion rome boasted 60 million slaves and slaves were just traded back and forth and many of them were redeemed. They were bought out of slavery. Not often, but many ended up being, having their heads, so to speak, out of that collar. And as we look at redemption, we see in Ephesians 1, and we look at Ephesians, that God plans this. God planned it. The Son paid for it. And the Holy Spirit of God applies it to our lives. Redemption involves the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit as we look at it through Ephesians here. And we as individuals need forgiveness. Yes, a verse is on forgiveness. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the person upon whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Who is a God like you? who pardons our iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retains not his anger forever because our God delights in mercy. He will turn again, he will have compassion, and he will cast our sins into the depth of the sea. I'm glad for that. I'm glad that my sins are gone. We used to sing that chorus, gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. The Nero Deep is in the Guam area of the Pacific. It's the deepest part of the ocean, any ocean. You can take Mount Everest. Anybody know how high Mount Everest is? 29,000 feet. Yeah, 29,000 plus feet. You can take Mount Everest and bury it in the Nero Deep. That's deep. And I like to see, attach that to this verse, it says, God has buried my sin in the depth of the sea. I am glad for forgiveness, people. You don't want to see some of this stuff in my rearview mirror. 
You don't want to see, I certainly don't want you to see it either. But I don't think that's unique with me. I think any one of us can look back and, boy, if only I could turn the time back and, and fix that or, or take back that or, or do something different in that situation. We all have these regrets. And those regrets cause guilt. And yet the beauty of this verse is that in Him, Jesus Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Amen to that. Amen. And this forgiveness, the Bible says in, in verse 7 and 8, that it's lavished upon us. God kind of keeps dumping it upon us. I grew up in a landlocked country, so three of my greatest experiences growing up was going to the ocean. But we traveled 2,000 miles to get to the ocean. Oh, wow. We went to Cape Town when I was five years old. We traveled for about a week, sleeping in hotels. We had a little car, yeah, not too big at all, six of us stacked in, no room for luggage. So my dad actually put the luggage on the train three weeks ahead, and we got our luggage when we got to Cape Town. Oh, my Lord. But for what it's worth, that's neither here nor there with my story. I remember being in the ocean, first time, never seen waves like that before. But the thing that struck me then and now, is basically those waves never stopped. It wasn't like there were a couple of waves and then there was calm. They are still the same wave, not the exact same wave, but the same part of that beach, you can go and see the waves. And that's the idea that Paul has when he says God lavishes upon us. Is forgiveness. Wow. Thank you, God, yeah. for forgiveness. If you thank God for the beauty of forgiveness, and forgiveness is part of the fact that I've been redeemed. Okay, if you go, the, the Bible is obviously rich, the Greek language. There are four different shades of meaning to redeem. First of all, I've got to secure something, then I've got to pay a price for that something. Then I actually buy it in order to free that something. But there's a fourth aspect of redemption. I free it in order to fulfill a purpose. Okay? I secure it. I pay for it. I free it. And I give it a purpose. That is what my redemption consists of when I look at what God is saying in these verses. He secured me. Look at verses 3 to 6 here. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. He chose me before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined me. He adopted me as a son through the Lord Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of His will. Thus to the praise of His glory, of His grace which was freely given through the one He loves. God secured me before the foundation of the world. He had me in mind. That is like, whoa, <coughs> hold the phone. Before God created the heaven and the earth, He had my name written on the palm of His hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He secured me. He purchased me with a payment. The Bible says I'm bought with a price. And Peter says that price is not silver and gold from the vain conversation I received from my forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. He uses those words, the precious blood of Christ. A, a, a cost that was infinite. And because it was infinite, he could redeem an infinite number of people. The wage of sin is death. I have incurred death. I will die for my sin. But Jesus took my place. He died for me. There's Barabbas walking around the city on, on that Good Friday, so, so to speak. And so he says, hey, Barabbas, I thought you were meant to be dead, man. He says, oh, no, 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 no. You see that man in the middle there? He took my place. I'm free because of him. And we can say that in a similar vein. I'm free today from the penalty of my sin. I'm free from the guilt of my sin because one died for me and shed his blood. An infinite price. And don't let's try to 
to throw God's scraps to pay for his son. This idea of a works religion, which is so common out there. You ask somebody, why are you going to have? No, oh, I'm a good person. Rubbish. There is none good. No, not one. It reminds me of the story of two boys who were swimming. They were friends, John and, and Michael. <clears throat> Michael got into trouble, and John dies saving his friend Michael. John is dead. Michael's alive. And the father of Michael comes to the father of John, the dead boy, and says, uh, you know, I'm really sorry about what happened uh, to your son. Here's $10. I'd like to pay you for your son. Oh, oh, 10 is not enough? How about $20? 50 Throw up. How could he have that type of audacity to think that a few dollars are going to pay him? the son that died saving another. But if we translate it to our lives, people, are we trying to do the same to God? Appease him with little scraps here and there and say, God, you owe me because of this. I cannot estimate the price that Christ paid for my life. All that father can do is go to the other father and say, thank you. Thank you for the gift that your son who died gave to only way I can understand the grace of God is through gratitude. God, thank you for what you did for me. Christianity is a bloody religion. William Copper, Cooper, as it's pronounced, said, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom from that guilt. But hold it. The trouble with Satan is he's our adversary and he's always out there trying to, to get to me. I had this in my files a long time. It's called the advocate. I sinned and straightway, post haste, Satan flew before the presence of the Most High God and made a railing accusation there. He said, this soul, this thing of clay and sod, he sinned. It's true that he has named thy name, but I demand his death, as you have said. The soul that sinneth it shall die. Shall not the sentence be fulfilled? Shall justice not be done? Send this wretched sinner to his doom. What other things can a righteous ruler do? And thus he accused me day and night. And every word he spoke was true. Then quickly one rose from God's right hand, before whose glory the angels veiled their eyes. He spoke, each jot and tittle of the law must be fulfilled. The guilty sinner, he must die. But wait, suppose his guilt was transferred to me, and I was the one to pay the penalty. Behold my hands, my side, my feet. One day I was made sin for him and died that he might be presented faultless before thee. Satan fled, for well he knew that he could not prevail against such love for every word my Lord spoke was true. That's redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins. The God who took it upon himself to send his son so that he could stand in the gap for you and for me. He secured my redemption. He paid for my redemption. He sets me free because I'm redeemed. There is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Satan so cannot get to me. But oh, he does. At least he tries to. I often ask people, should conscience be your guide? No. No. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit within me is my guide. And Satan will come and he will ride our conscience as the accuser of the brethren. He will put you on a hamster wheel of guilt. And you've got to stop there and then and say, God, yeah, I've sinned. That dishonored you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Thank you that I am forgiven and my guilt is removed. Don't listen to Satan's lies telling you how bad you are. 
you are righteous in Jesus Christ. He becomes my righteousness. I don't have to listen to those lies. And inevitably that false accusation is some nebulous, not really named sin. It's just kind of a, he gets on my case, we've been there. Christ redeems me from my guilty conscience. He deals with the accuser of the brethren. If I confess my sin, God is faithful. God is just to forgive me. I am forgiven. <coughs> Thanks be to God. And the Bible goes on here. It says that he did this, that we might be adopted as children because of what he did. I am adopted into the family of God. Now, I don't get in the family of God through adoption. I live in the family of God by adoption. I get into the, the, into the family of God by faith in Christ's death and resurrection. But having received Christ, I am part of his family. Can you believe that? I'm in the family of God. Paul goes as far, you can call God Abba, Daddy, because of that relationship. Yeah, we are familiar with folks who have adopted people. Their love, their grace, their compassion, their desire to rescue those people is enormous. <clears throat> Transfer that a multiple, multiple times to God. He wanted us in his family and did all that was necessary to put us there. Okay, so redemption. Secure it. Pay for it. Having got it, free it. But free it for a reason, for a purpose. It says that we may be holy and blameless before him in love. God wants us holy and blameless. Okay, holy the boy came out of church, the pastor having spoken on holiness, he was very unhappy. His dad said, what's the problem? He says, it's real hard to be holy and happy. <laughs> There's a truth to that, okay? We'd be happier if we could do what was easy and what was wrong. Be easier to just fulfill the lust of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life. Uh, but no, no, a, you want to be happy, you've got to be holy. But God wants you holy in order to be happy. Don't no mistake the two. The idea of blamelessness doesn't mean I'm faultless. And the Bible talks about Simeon and Job being blameless before God. <coughs> Simply, blameless can be traced to Paul's comment in uh, before uh, Felix, I think of Felix or, or Festus, where he said, I've determined to have a conscience void of offense between God and man. I want my conscience to be clear when I face God. I don't want sin remaining there and before mankind. And that behooves us to take that. If we're going to be blameless, nobody should be able to point a finger at me and say, you did that and you never tried to straighten it out. You following me that? I'm not blameless if somebody can point to my life and say, hey, you ripped me off or you tarnish my name, or you, or you, or whatever it is. I need to do what I need to do to be blameless, to go to that person and say, I want you to forgive me for what I did. And maybe there's someone today that could point a finger at us because of some sin that you haven't sought to reconcile. That may mean reparation. You may have to pay for having ripped them off financially, whatever it is. But do what you need to do to have a conscience that's void of offense between God and man. God wants us holy. God wants us blameless. And it's found there. The possibility is that in Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sin. It goes off with a short story of a, a young woman who basically lived a very evil, sordid life to do almost everything under the sun but God graciously pulled her out of that enslavement of sin. Joined a church, became involved in the church, ended up teaching one of the Sunday school classes, walked with God as a result of having been redeemed and forgiven. She caught the eye of the pastor's son and he asked her to marry if she would marry him. But there were a lot of wagging tongues in the church who began to gossip and say, no, this is not right. Look at what she was, look at what she did, look at how she lived her life. And it got so bad the pastor had called a meeting and there were accusations flying back and forth until somebody stood up and said, hold it. 
It's not this God who's on trial today. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. Is his blood sufficient to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Questions on her life, her background. The question is whether we believe what God did through Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And cleansed I stand before him now because I have redemption. I have the forgiveness of sin. God secured me. He paid for me. He freed me and he's placed me to fulfill a purpose of being holy and blameless. That's our call. That's how we give God the glory and the thanks and the gratitude for having saved us by living a life pleasing to Him. Amen. And Lord, thank Amen. you that there's forgiveness, <coughs> redemption, cleansing because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We worship you, we praise you, we honor you, we pray that our lives may reflect clearly. <coughs> In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got a closing song here, and then we'll uh, take off. You guys got to... Yeah, yeah, we have a question. Sorry. Okay. I'll sing your part. Okay, do that. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Spock, take care. Don't forget your dish. Thank you. <laughs> Till I grow
reconciled us to yourself. I pray that you will help each of us as we are now adopted into your family, that we will live our lives for you, and that we will be able to serve you in all things. In your name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen.